come and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly, and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Shabbat Shalom Achim. Um, we are uh, another day here. It is uh, Saturday, uh, Yom Shabbat. And uh, last night I had a wonderful uh, time with uh, Jason Egroff on Revelation News Radio. And it is, for those that are not aware of it, we do every night, Friday night live, uh, a Shabbat program with Brother Jason Egroff on uh, Revelation News Radio. He's opened up that forum for us to be able to speak to people and to, uh, to come together. It gives you an opportunity to call in and ask questions and we can talk together a little bit. The last hour of the show pretty much is open for that purpose. Uh, you can go into a live chat on there. So uh, it's just real, uh, a real blessing and I thank God uh, for Brother Jason that he has opened up that forum to us. I want to get right into this message here. I'm going to basically go back into the message I spoke about on Revelation News Radio and uh, uh, maybe a little bit deeper into it and because it was certainly a blessing. is a blessing to me because I learned quite a few things that I didn't even know myself just as God began to unfold and reveal things in this message. Um, I would like to take you, though, directly into the book of Exodus. We're going to speak about the true light of Hanukkah. And um, it's going to get very interesting. But I wanted to start out with Exodus. Kind of an odd place to go. Uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 15, for those of you that are following along. And um, that's where I want to start because there's a very important message here that starts this whole thing off. A, a, a warning, uh, you might have it. God says here... Um, in, through his prophet Moses, he speaks here, and this is when Pharaoh, Moses has killed the Egyptian, he's, he's having to flee, and so in verse 15, that's where it picks up, and says, now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh, and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well, hmm, interesting, isn't it, he sat down by a well, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to the water to water their flock, their father's flock. And shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Raoul, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. You know, guys, even as I'm reading this to you, the Lord is showing me things I didn't know about last night. It is utterly amazing. The beautiful parallel to this, this 
is so prophetic and it's so profound in so many ways that I didn't even see it last night. Where do I begin with this? This is prophetic in ways beyond that I can even explain even now as I'm looking at this. One, it is a it foreshadows Yeshua sitting at the well with the Samaritan woman. It speaks of the waters of life that would flow from him. It is, speaks of the identity of Mashiach and who he is. And yet here it is, the seven daughters of Rahul speak of the seven churches of Asia Minor in the book of Revelation. And it speaks of the church, the Gentile believers that would believe down through the ages. Okay? It speaks about how that the shepherds would be the ones that would be driving the people away from who he really is. Who the identity of Mashiach really is. The ones that should be helping the women to come and not driving them back, not driving back the daughters of Israel, but should be helping them to get the water to feed the flocks, and yet they're the ones driving them back. The same problem was happening in Jesus' day when he met the woman at the well. She had to come at a different hour of the day. Interesting. She couldn't come because, she, you know, well, it's obvious. You know, when Jesus talks to the woman, he says to her, go get your husband. She says, I have no husband. He says, you've told the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. So she was living in adultery according to the law. And so therefore, as an adulterous woman, she was not considered, you know, she didn't come the same time to get water because she was not, quote unquote, married properly. And so she was pushed back. But the thing is that she was a daughter of Almighty God. She was a daughter of Abraham. But the shepherds, the rabbis of that day pushed her back. Just like today, the, the, the ministers of today in Christianity push you back from the waters of life. They don't want you to know who Mashiach really is. Because if you knew who he really was, that water of life, the Spirit of Almighty God that would indwell in you and would fill you and would give you freedom and revelation of who He is, His identity. And, and even for the sake, and, and, and this is not just in the Christian circles as well, this is among the, the, this is also speaking, like I said, this is such a tremendous revelation. It speaks of the rabbis today that are the shepherds of Israel who are pushing the Jewish people back because they don't want you to know who Mashiach really is. They don't want you to know about this Yeshua. And yet the whole story right here that we read of Moses was also unfolding with the Samaritan woman in front of the well when Yeshua came as well. Same, same parallel. And as I said, the parallel of the modern day shepherds of Christianity pushing the people back of the identity of Mashiach. Incredible here. Let me just read this to you once again. Uh, Pharaoh, he sought his life. So Moses uh, fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and he sat down by a well. The same thing Yeshua did. He sat down by the well and the woman came out to draw the water. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. You, you know, another parallel here beautifully as well. The suppression of women that they're not allowed to say anything about the Word of God. They're kept silent in the churches. Why? Because they're women. And who are the ones that does it? The shepherds. Keep your mouth shut. Doesn't it say, it also saith in the law, let her learn at home. You pervert the Greek scriptures because why? You do not want no one knowing 
what the truth is. A patriarchal movement when Yeshua come and freed the women to begin with. Notice, no, isn't this funny? Because Yeshua, and here's the other parallel with that right there. Yeshua tells the woman at the well, and buddy, she goes in and preaches the gospel that a man come and told me everything I ever did. Is this not Mashiach? She was not afraid. And they listened. But that little patriarchal thing kind of popped back up in there. You know, when they come, they heard Jesus for themselves. And they said, now we believe not because of your testimony, but because we heard him ourselves. <laughs> Gosh. Ooh, it's hard to get rid of that, you know. And, oh, by the way, next, uh, this coming Friday, the next Sh uh, Shabbat Live that we have, uh, we will be talking about the women issues. And uh, we'll be having possibly two guests on. My wife will be one. She is very uh, learned in the uh, Koine Greek language and uh, some interesting insights. You'll find out there, like, for example, kephale, the word for head in the uh, Christian Bible has nothing to do with authority. I mean, let's face it for granted. What, what did, when Paul was speaking there and he says to the, to, the, to the masters over the slaves, or he says to the slaves, slaves, obey your masters. Now, the word there that he uses in Greek is a, a, a word of authority. But does that mean that slavery was, was ordained of Almighty God that we should have a right to have slaves? No. In fact, when we finally realized slavery is wrong, what happened? Abraham Lincoln had the audacity and the gumption and was man enough to set the proclamation and set slaves free because he said all men were created equal. But, no, you know, but yet they were still trying to hold on to Paul's writing and said, no, you should be a slave because it says so. And then they were right in the fact that, yes, it is an authority. It, that word is authoritative. But when you use the word that the man is the head of the woman and Christ is the head of the man and God is the head of Christ. The word kephale here has nothing to do with authority. But in English, yes, the word head could be a boss. It could be something over something. But kephale in, 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 in Koine Greek has nothing to do with authority. It means the source of. And that's exactly right. God himself, and we're going to get into this as we get into the Hanukkah story, God made himself tangible, he brought forth the light, the Logos, and that is Mashiach, that is Christ. He's, he also made that body for himself to dwell in. So God is the source of Yeshua. Now, Yeshua is the one that created all things, including Adam and Eve. So he created Adam, so he is the source of Adam, and Eve was inside of that body of Adam, and God put Adam into a deep sleep, and he taken from Adam, or from Ish, from the man, literally from Ish, mean Ish, and he, cre and he brings forth Isha, his bride, so the man is that source or where she came from. See, now it begins to make sense. And, you know, I know that the famous one that some men would probably run to, and, of course, we'll get into all this next week if you want to come to Shabbat Live there um, on Revelation News Radio, is that uh, you like, there's a lot of people like that scripture, you know, let her be, uh, what is it, uh, for, for wives to be subject to their husbands. Do you realize that's not even in the original Greek manuscript? The entire sentence is not there. That was put in there intentionally the whole thing is a movement and so here's what's interesting here we have the same problem right here in exodus and he says here now the priests of midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock they were ordained to water the flock they were shepherds and the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them. Interesting. Moses, just same thing with Yeshua. Yeshua didn't put the women down. He stood up and helped them. Somebody needs to stand up. God bless Lee Grady. And Lee may be on with us next Friday. All right, I've done told you now who the guest speaker might be with us. So we'll have to see. Um, we'll, we'll contact Lee. We know Lee uh, personally, so... See if he's able to come on. Uh, those of you that don't know him, look him up, Lee Grady. Marvelous uh, champion for women. Uh, I think Lee kind of got caught into it, though. He kind of like Raul. He had nothing but daughters. So uh, uh, kind of cute story he talks about. Anyway, um, let's continue on down here. 
The shepherds came and drove them away. Moses stood up for them. He watered the flock, and they came to Raoul, their father. And and of course, how is uh, he, how is it that you are come so soon today? Now, remember, this is not though just. Uh, I put the focus here in women, and being able to speak the word. But the focus here is that the shepherds are driving the people away from the water of life. There today, the Jewish rabbis are driving the Jewish people away from recognizing who Mashiach is. The Christian ministers are driving the Christians away of knowing truly the revelation of who Mashiach is. Because believe me, there is a scripture in the New Testament that speaks not only to the Jews, but it speaks to the Jew, the Christian as well. And G Jesus himself says this. Let me take you to this. Oh, gosh, I get so excited here. Um... Mm -mm. I said this one to Brother Jason last night. He said, I didn't even know that. It's in John chapter 8, verse uh, 24. I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Now, Interesting thought here for you, as I speak the same thing when it comes to the women's scriptures. Uh, they're so messed up in trying to preserve the doctrines that they have today, they added the word he in there. Yeshua never said, except that you believe that I am he. He said, except, he said, you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. Read it the way it was written by John. That is powerful. Okay. Now that we've set the basis, we've set the fundamental background for this. You know, I, I did a video some time back. In fact, I was looking at it the other day because I was trying to remember some of the things the Lord had revealed to me there. Um, I think it was... Uh, New Insight Stuns Jewish Believer or something like that. And this is when God first revealed all this to me. Uh, not everything here, but he revealed a lot of this to me. Let me see here. Um, I thought I had. And I know I do. Pardon me. Um, wow. Where did I put? Okay. I'm going to have to do it with the computer here. I, I didn't want to do that. I have the, I have the Tanakh here with me, but uh, I wanted you to see... A um, uh, particular, well, it's a little bit tougher. Oh, there it is. Okay. This is what kind of got all this started on the identity of the Messiah. And I, and, and I kind of did a little backwards uh, last night in the radio broadcast here, but I'm going to start where it started at for me originally. And it was this right here. It's a famous saying. And, 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 and let me clarify something as I say this, or before I read this here, because this is a famous scripture that is quoted by the oneness uh, movement. And, uh, and I don't think, when I look at my own self, I don't really consider myself a oneness nor, nor a Trinitarian as far as in that. I, I am a Jewish believer who believes that Yeshua is Mashiach, uh, I don't believe that Yeshua is his own father either, uh, if that kind of helps clarify some things there. So, but there is a balance actually between the two different groups if they would ever come to the middle and recognize where this truly is, of who uh, the identity of Mashiach actually is. And this is what we're going to go into. And we're going to see how God unfolds this. A beautiful, beautiful revelation here. Uh, so when I read this, I know that some Trinitarian believers would say, oh my gosh, he's going to be a oneness, look at the scripture he's going to quote. No, that's not the case. Uh, and I also know that many Trinitarians have a wonderful revelation of who Mashiach really is. Uh, so we're going to look at the Trinitarian, um, um, I, I, I'm, let me say it like this, I'm not doing a doctrine of what the Trinitarian belief is. Uh, this is this message here is for you to understand who Mashiach is. And so I think what happens is in the process of this, you begin to understand the revelation for those of you that are that are Trinitarians, you begin to understand the revelation you have and and, and that it matches what you believe. Um, 
but then there'll be some that'll be like, oh, wow, never heard it like that before. Same thing with the oneness people. You begin to say, oh my gosh, you know, he sounds more like us, but then you start realizing that, whoa, wait a minute, there's, there, it just comes to the middle because this is where the truth of this is at. It's, it lays more in the middle of all this. So in John chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Oh, Brother Paul Begley, by the way, that's my coffee. It, I like the iced coffee. Um, I like it cold, not hot. Actually, I don't like coffee at all. So, Anyway, God bless Brother Paul Begley. I love that brother. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, or without Him was not anything made that was made, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Let's stop right there, because we're going to go to Genesis in just a moment here. What happened to me, I was reading this one day, just kind of casually opened the Bible, and when I began to read, the thing that struck me was the fact that John goes back to Genesis. He's referring to Genesis, where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, when I saw that, if it's in the beginning was the word, I want to know what was the first word in the beginning. What's the first word that God himself says in Bereshit, in Genesis? And so that's where we're going at next to look at the identity of Mashiach. And um, it gets better and better all the time. So let's take this. I'm going to take you into this through the Hebrew language as well as translate for you in English so it doesn't confuse you. Um... Because sometimes the English translation does not do this justice, and I want you to really catch something here. Uh, the very first sentence in uh, Genesis, Belashit, which means at the first, uh, Rashit is first, uh, or in the first. Uh, we just translate that at the beginning, which is perfectly fine too. Belashit Baralhim et Hashemayim et Haaretz, which means at the beginning or at the first, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, many scholastic uh, Christians, uh, uh, scholars that, 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 that look at the Hebrew language, one of the first things that they like to look at is the word Elohim because of the plural suffix on the word there, the Yod Mim making it plural. El, Elo, uh, Elohai or Elohim, which makes it seem as if there are multiple divinities and um, but yet we know that the scripture plainly says that the Lord thy God is one God uh, it's uh, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad now the word Adonai actually in here is, it should be read actually you no know, we read it this way and um, I kind of like Brother Gary Lowry's pronunciation of the divine name of God I can't say that that's exactly right and I can't say or it may be right and I just can't pronounce it right myself because it's not been revealed to me but the dream that Brother Gary had of the rabbis the seven rabbis that were praising God and he said it sounded something like Yahweh is what it sounded like uh, so I'm still waiting to see if the Lord will reveal to me, but uh, it actually says Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Okay, so that's what the word actually says there, that he is one. All right, now, if God is one, then why do we have Elohim? Why do we have a plural for the form of God? In a lot of the Trinitarian beliefs, it, they tend to take that word there and they say that represents Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, there's some truth in that. Okay, so before the oneness want to bash on that, there is actually some truth in that. But, let's rightly divide it so you understand who he really is. So let's look at this again. Bereshit bara Elohim. Now, in Hebrew... If the noun is plural, such as Elohim, then we must have a plural verb. It's not like English. It's a lot different than English. So therefore, the word created, bara, would have to actually read, barashit barim Elohim, et hashemayim et haaretz, if there was more than one God present at that time. Hmm. See, brings it into a different light now. Now, a lot of people believe that when God was creating everything, that Yeshua and God were standing side by side and they created things together. Well, this is why Jews know that that's not true. 
And yet we have right here written in John 1.1, 1, 1, right at the very beginning there, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. There's another scripture as well in John that talks about everything, both invisible and invisible, was made by him, and nothing was made that wasn't made without, you know, in other words, he made, Yeshua made everything. So, how does this work now? Elohim is in because God is identified in different ways. Some say attributes. I like to say God is can manifest himself however he so chooses. But you're going to find here in the first paragraph in Genesis that God himself is going to identify himself in three ways right off the bat. So it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shemayim and God created, singular, in other words, only one God was present, created the heavens and the earth. Doesn't say how long he took to do it, just said he did it. Ve ha-ares hayata, excuse me, ve ha-ares hayata tohu vavohu, ve choshek alpane tachum. Okay, and the earth is without... It's, 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 a start, it's without form, without voice, it's void, it's, it's empty, and, and the darkness is upon the, the, the surface of, of the deep. Okay, that's what that says. Here comes another identity of God. God expressing himself now, not just as creator, the invisible God creating, now he's expressing himself as spirit. The Ruach Elohim, the spirit of God. Another part of God Himself, see, Merchafet Alpene Hamayim. He is, it is, the Spirit of God is moving over the face of the deep, over the waters, over the face of the waters. Do you not realize that in the life of Yeshua, when He's here on the earth, He's showing you who He is? Joshua Allen, he sent me an email the other day. A little brother, he's always, he's always sending me nice emails of things that God is putting on his heart. And that was one that he brought out, brings out about uh, Yeshua walking on the water being a type of God brooding over the water in Genesis. And my wife asked me the question. She said, I could have sworn you've talked about that before. I said, I, I have. I, I have uh, spoke about that before. And, uh, and I guess Brother Joshua had not seen that as of yet. And I don't even know if I even spoke about it on, on video or not, but... I told my wife about that one day, the, the, the analogy of that. But as amazing, though, Brother Joshua has seen that himself as well. God bless him, and I thank God. Just, by the way, that is a proof right there. You know, you don't, you know, I appreciate the people that support the ministry, that, 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 go, that follow this ministry, but God deals with every one of us as an individual. In his sight, the playing field is level. There's no big eyes. There's no little U's. We're all the same in the sight of Almighty God. And He can reveal to you as easy as He can reveal to me something. All it takes is for you to get before Him. Now, I guess in some cases, He gives a gift because He's wanting to get something out. Maybe that's the case. I don't know how God does these things, but it's beautiful because I get friends that write me all the time. Chuck Missler, in fact, said something the other day that blew me away as well. When Chuck said that Eve's name, when she was given the name Eve, not before she wasn't even called Eve, she was just called Isha. But when she's called Chava, we translate that the mother of life, he said it's much deeper than what you're just thinking, not the mother of mankind. He, it was showing that in a prophetic point, that through her seed, she would be the mother of life, which would be Yeshua. And I saw Chuck say that, I'm like, whoa, man, Chuck, praise God. That's a, that's a high five. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, it, just beautiful there. So what do we have here? God, you know, Yeshua was showing it, when he was there with his disciples. He's showing that uh, he's walking on the face of the waters. He's showing you that he is the spirit of almighty God in Genesis. No wonder why John has such a marvelous revelation of the identity of Mashiach because he sees these things himself. I mean, you have to keep in mind, John, Yohanan, as in Hebrew we say his name, he walked with him, he breathed, he, 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 he slept with him, he saw the miracles, miracles that are not even written, he's seen these things. 
This is why he was able to identify him is not just Yeshua, God is salvation. He was able to identify that well, he was the one in the beginning. He was the one with God. He was God. It was God in him. He was the spirit of God that moved on the face of the deep. It was God that created everything that exists. He is the Elohim. He is the all of it. And he's in a body right now. That's See, that's what the difference is. Yeshua, it's not that Yeshua was back there. Yeshua represents God as salvation. But it was the God, the fullness of God that was in Yeshua that was back there that was manifesting himself in different ways. And then God, him, it's God himself became salvation. So many things going through my mind right now. It's unbelievable. So he walks, he, he broods on the face of the earth. Let me go back to this in Hebrew. Melchafet al pene hamayim. And by the way, melchafet, that brooding word there, is a feminish word. You tell me God doesn't have a feminish side. The spirit of God is the feminish side of God. It is the characteristic of him in a feminine form. No wonder why his spirit is what he pours out upon his bride. Just as Adam, when he brought, when God brought forth Eve from Adam's side, he brought forth the feminish part. Wow, this is incredible. Mm, okay, I don't want to lose you on this. So he, he broods on the face of the uh, face of the waters, just like Yeshua walked on the water. The Yomer, here comes again. The Yomer Elohim. Now God has a voice and can speak which he was speaking when he was creating. Believe me, he wasn't that just not speaking. But here's when I, this is what made me wonder. Why does John say in the beginning was the word and the word was with God? Now, and the word was God, not a God, he was God, okay? And by the way, those of the Jehovah's Witnesses that want to say a God, if you want to take that Greek word that John used right there, okay, and that is theos, all right, because the other times, I'll, I have to give give credit where credit's due. One thing we can say, on the other times, um, hang on. Excuse me. Okay, no, no, my bad. Anyway, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses want to say that it was a God, and they put a little G in there. Well, the very word that you use there that you put the little g in is used in your Jehovah's Witness Bible, where you identify places as a speaking of Yahweh, the divine name Hashem. You actually identify that with the same word. So I guess, does that make Yahweh a little god? No, it doesn't. Not, Jehovah's Witness people that listen, you would understand this. You'd know where I'm talking about on that. I actually did a research on that one time because of their theology. And, uh, of course, they translate that one in their Bible as divine. Uh, but when it comes to Jesus, they want to make him a little God. So they would understand where I'm going on that. But I uh, know that's a little different here. So anyway, going back here. So we have right here, uh, the Yomer, and he said, Elohim, God, Yahi Or. Let there be light is how that's translated. But the Yahi is so deep in the expression. It's eternity. It's, it's bringing eternity into existence in the form of light. It is God, the Logos, manifesting now. He first comes in as creator. Elohim is creator. Then Elohim is spirit. Now Elohim is light. So if you want to look at a Trinitarian view, you've got a Trinity right here. But it's not three different people. It's always the same God, all the time. It's just God manifesting himself in different ways. Now, hmm. so God becomes light. There is your Hanukkah. Dude, by the way, those of you that don't know the story of Hanukkah, when the Maccabee brothers, when they stood up against the oppression of Israel, and they go back and they fight and they take the temple back. And by the way, that was, the book of Maccabees is a part of the Bible. So you need to look it up, get it, read it. It is a part of the word of God. Yeshua celebrated Hanukkah. Okay? So let's keep it where it belongs in the word of God. There are books that are left out 
that should not be left out. And I think the Book of Enoch is another one. It's actually the Book of Enoch is in the, the was was found in the, in in Qumran and it's part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, part of the actual Bible itself. Uh, so yes, it was uh, part of the Bible. Now, like any other book, could there have been mistranslations down through the ages? No doubt. I, I have no idea. But uh, but it's very interesting to uh, to bring these things out. So, all right now, so we see that God becomes light. He says, Elohim, uh, Elohim, Yahi Od, the Yahi Od, and it was light. Now, this is what's important here, because John is identifying this in here, because he says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Hmm. That's another interesting point. Because what do we have when we go on down into Genesis here? Um, this is in um, in Genesis chapter 1. God said, Let us make man in our image. Uh, they shall rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over the animals, the whole earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now notice, they shall rule. And you wonder why Raoul's daughter were watering the flock? Because they were given commandment to rule together. So God created man in his image, and in the image of God created, he, created him, male and female created he them. Man re actually represents mankind because the word man, Adam, comes from the word Adama. In other words, the body, the body that's being made is formed from the dust of the earth. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and everything that moves on it, on earth. Now, there are a lot of scholars, and I hate to say it, even Chuck does this as well, that assume that when Eve is speaking to God about the serpent and what he did, or no, when she's speaking to the serpent and she quotes what God said, don't even look at it, don't even touch at it, touch the, the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, that she's adding something to the word. Um, and it's assumed that because they think that God only told Adam not to do these things. Well, see, if that were the case, then why didn't God get on, why didn't he judge her also for lying? Or bearing false witness, because it would be bearing false witness. God never deals with Eve for bearing false witness. So therefore, we have to conclude that Eve never bore false witness in, in that matter. Now, I'm kind of jumping forward, and I shouldn't do that on you here. Let's go back. Um, in Hebrew, um, God originally calls Adam. He doesn't call him Adam. He calls him Ish which is a compound word. Rabbis do recognize that it's from the word Aish, fire, Aleph, Shin, and from the divine name, first letter of the divine name of God, the Yod in the middle of his name, Aleph, Yod, Shin, Ish is how you spell that. And the word fire that is there, and being that the Yod is in there, it's letting us know that what the fire of God, or the spirit of God, or the light of God, is what gave him his life. In fact, we find that when he forms the body of the dust of the earth, God says to him, and let me just find that for you real quick. Elohim et ha'adom afa min ha'adama. And God forms him uh, from, from uh, the man from the dust of the ground. The yipach be pav nishmat chayim now, interesting enough here, we have two things that you can see here. When he talks about he breathes the breath of life, and then man becomes a living soul. Now, when he speaks of the man as a living soul himself, he speaks of that life in a singular. But when he breathes that life in there, he breathes it in a plural, the chayim. 
Remember what God called the two trees in the midst of the garden, the one he called the tree of life. Eitz Chaim. That's God's own life. That is Yahweh's life. That is, his life is what that tree is. That tree is God's life in internal form. That is the spirit of Almighty God represented as a tree. And so God comes and he breathes in the nostrils of Adam, the human body, the nishmar chayim, and he becomes a living soul. Now, oh wow, so many things that are just in that alone. Why does he breathe it in a plural? Because he made both Adam and Eve as one unit, one being. And because he made them as one being, he has to breathe in a plural form. This is why. Notice, this is why when, oh gosh, uh, so many places I want to take you with this, okay? Notice, let me say like this here. He breathed in the body. He breathed that breath of life. Remember I said a moment to you ago about Yeshua and how that when he walked on the water, he was showing that he was the God that was in Genesis. All right, the same thing here about the breathing the breath of life. It was Yeshua when after his death, burial, and resurrection, when he came up and he breathed on his apostles and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm paraphrasing that. What was he doing? He's showing his disciples. He, this is this. By the way, those of you that wanted me to preach, I was told you I was going to preach about being born again. This is being born again. This is the new birth. You deem this is it. Teladim Chadesha. This is the new birth. It is to receive the life of Hashem in our own beings, which is the spirit of God that was inside of Yeshua. If you, that's why he said, except that you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins, or except that you believe that I am. You have to believe that He is the I am, that He is the Eitz Chaim. You must believe this. In order to receive his life within you. Because if you don't believe it, his life will not come in you. When Jesus talks about being born again, that's what he's talking about. Because why? Adam and Eve, when they were born, they were born, God breathed that breath of life in them. And Yeshua was showing that he was the God that was there in the Garden of Eden that breathed the breath of life in them. That's what he's showing them. That's what he did by that expression to them when he breathed upon them right there in, in, in the garden there. He, you know, he breathed on them and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why do you think John could write what he writes? The tree of life had been cut off from Adam and Eve because of sin. And their children were born. God tells them already in the beginning, be fruitful and multiply and bring forth children. Okay, the commandment to bring forth the children is already given. He tells them to do that. How can anybody say that it, that, that it is for some other time? No, he told them to do it. And they're going to do this, and they're going to bring forth children, but the problem is, because they sinned, the tree of life is now guarded, preserved. And God cuts off that way of tree of life so that as their children are born, there's no way to receive the spirit of God's life inside of them. Now, as I said to you though, let me back up so I don't go too far or too fast on you here. He breathed that life in a plural form because Eve was in that body. When God pulls Eve from Mean ish. I want to say it that way. I don't want to say from Adam because he actually takes from mean ish. The scripture says from the man, which the word ish was used in Hebrew for the word man there, mean ish from that man or from the fire of Yahweh, he takes and he makes isha. Not Eve, not Chava. Why is she not called Chava then? Because at that point, there's no need for her to be the mother of all living because all, the, 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 all living is right there in the garden. The one that is the source of eternal life is there with them. She doesn't have to be the mother of all living. Why? Because there's no need of redemption. 
So she's not called Chava, she's called Isha. Which is what? The feminine form of the fire of God. It is after the fall that Adam calls her name Chava. Because now God has prophesied to them And we're going to go to that right now. Now see, Adam says she's bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh because he, God took her from him. But let's go here and let's see what happens. God is going to prophesy. The, the, the serpent comes in, he beguiles Eve. They realize they're naked. You know, I don't think that nakedness has anything to do with what we consider naked today. I really don't. They were clothed in the Word, in the light, the Shekinah glory of God, the fire of God. There was no nakedness to be seen. You didn't see their nakedness because they were clothed with Him, with His righteousness. Okay, they're hiding from God, and God says here in Genesis 3.10, he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I am naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you are naked? And have you eaten of the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and, and I ate. And Hashem God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And Hashem God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Accursed you, are you be, uh, beyond all the cattle and beyond all the beasts of the field, and upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, which is hatred, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will pound your head, and you will bite his heel, or he will bruise your head, is another way that we translate that. God is prophesying. Now, here's what's funny. Most Christians realize God is prophesying of the coming of Mashiach. Hmm. Why don't they get all the rest of this prophetically? To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your suffering and your childbearing, and pain you shall bear children. Yet your craving shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, it says actually in Hebrew, Teladai Benim. He literally says to her, You shall birth sons. Ve'elayshach tashuch decha. Originally, if you want to go back far enough in the translations, the rabbis actually says, in the tra translation of, the translating of this word here, and I can see exactly why. It's a, it's a, it's a compounded word uh, with multiple there. It's like three words in one. He says, you will turn to your husband. That tells us that Eve had a direct relationship with God himself. She was not, she had no middleman. Her husband was not an intercessor for her for, to God. So all this intercessing days and stuff that people think that when they say, well, man is the priest of the home. I can't find that. In fact, anyway, watch right here. Behu imashal becha. And he shall rule over you. God is only prophesying, just as he prophesies of the coming of the Messiah and what the Messiah will do, that the serpent will bruise his heel, but he will bruise the serpent's head. God is also prophesying to Eve that her husband will rule over her. Why? Not because of divine decree. Do you think God is going to reward Adam? Well, Adam, you messed up and you caused creation to go plummeting into the darkness now. So, by the way, seeing as you were such a good man, I think I'll make you the boss. Hmm. You know, the thing is, the scripture plainly says to he that knoweth to do right and doeth wrong, that is the greater sin. The Bible also clearly tells us in the law that if you do not know what you're doing and you do it, it is God considers the thought and intent of the heart and there is more mercy for that person there. But he that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So the sin laid with Adam not his wife. Hers was done in ignorance. And so there was more mercy in her case. So why would God put Adam a ruler over his wife uh, for having the greater sin? 
It's not a rulership. It's a prophecy is what it is. And to Adam he said, Because you listened to the voice of your wife and ate of the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat, accursed is the ground because of you. Now, a lot of times they use that one as well and everything. See, you shouldn't listen to the voice of your wife. Well, that's kind of funny because God tells Abraham when, uh, when Sarah wants to throw out Hagar, everything that seems cruel to do to this woman that, says that he has taken as a wife at her, even her bidding to do so, Sarah wants her thrown out and her child. But the funny thing is, God tells Abraham, hearken or listen to the voice of your wife. So it's not... Literally, Adam messed up because he listened to his wife. Adam only messed up because he knew the commandment not to do it, but he did it anyway. So he listened to a voice that he shouldn't be listening to when the voice is telling him something, what? Contrary to the Word of God. It's not the fact that your wife says something that makes it wrong. It's when the Word that comes, whether it be man or woman, comes from your lips, and it's not according to the Word of God. That's what God tells you not to listen to. In this case... Eve was trying to get her husband to do something that Adam knew that was wrong. Eve knew that it was wrong. But they messed up. So anyway, this is, this is what we find, you know, as far as the, the fall goes. Now, in the prophecy of all this, there, there is so much more that can be said here as well. But... Going back, I want to back up just a little bit, though, because I want to, again, we're looking at the identity of Mashiach here. I know we've gotten pretty lengthy here, so I'm going to try to wrap this up here in just a few minutes here. A lot of things I still want to touch on, though, so let's see how we can get with this. When God created Adam, what did he do? Because this is dealing with the new birth. God put Adam into a deep sleep to bring forth his bride. And when he brought her forth, he, take, he, you know, he pulls her out from Adam. Now the sin comes in. All chaos breaks loose on earth. Now, now this is the part when I get back to the part about Eve. Now, because of this and the sin, and when she brings forth her first son, Adam calls, let me just see here where this is actually at, just so we can kind of get in this here. Um, now this after the fall by the sweat of your brow shall you eat in bread okay for you dust you are and dust you shall return then the, the man called his wife's name Eve because she had become the mother of all living now that's interesting in itself um, verse 20 on that right there let me just pull that up Okay, okay, here it is. Here we go. Elohim la Adam ula ishto. See, she she is his the, the mother. Katanot od veila b'shem of all the names. And of course, Chuck brings out the the beautiful thought thought there that. It was because she would be the mother of, or in prophetically speaking, because it's her seed, that she would be the mother of Mashiach. And that's what it is. So that, that, that's such a beautiful analogy right there. Um, I love that. But anyway, so what happens? God puts, um, puts this deep sleep over Adam, and he brings forth his wife, but then the fall comes in, so it cuts off the way. Of the tree of life. Now the children are being born, but they can't be born with the Spirit of Almighty God anymore. No, there's no longer the Spirit of God to breathe into the to the nostrils of these children the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is what causes this problem. Now, when Yeshua was here, that's why I say that, like the woman at the well, he gives her that sign to look for. If you knew it was, it was talking to you. You'd ask me for a drink, and I would give you water that you don't have to come here. And she speaks about, you know, you know, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit, the water of life right there, which he's given her that sign because of the rock that Moses smote in the wilderness. You remember when Moses, God commands Moses at the beginning of the journey. Now, there's two times that he does this to Moses. The second time, God tells Moses, go and speak to the rock. The first time, though, he tells him, go and smite the rock. Take the elders of Israel and go out and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. Now, in that particular incident, 
What are they doing? They're arguing. Let me just bring that up. So you'll know what this is all about here. Um, this is in Exodus chapter 17. And the Lord God, the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river and take in thy hand and go and behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock. Don't forget that. God is going to be on the rock. Yeshua is that rock. It's God that is upon him. His anointing is upon him. The anointing of God. You know what is Isaiah 61? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. All right? And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He was to smite the rock, and the water, when the rock was smitten, the water was to come out. The elders of Israel took Yeshua, and they judged him. And they, they, that's why he took the elders of Israel out there, was to judge him. And when they smite him, the water should come out. When the Roman soldier stuck him in his side, the waters of life came out. How do we miss all this? Now, here's what's even more important, though. The, the water is the, the Spirit of God, the eternal life. When God opened up Adam's side, he took from Adam Isha, and he made that woman, he made that bride. Yeshua was put into a deep sleep as well, as Adam was put into a deep sleep. And when he was put into a deep sleep, his side was opened up like God opened up Adam's side. And as God opened up Adam's side to bring out his bride, Yeshua was put into a deep sleep. And the elders of Israel judged him, and they ripped his side open and brought forth God's bride. Or the spirit within this Mashiach, that was to come back upon the believer so that you could be united with your God. This is your new birth. This is being born again. It's to receive the eternal life. Now, how do you know how to receive the eternal life? It's believing that he is what? That he is I am. I'll prove it to you right here because it's, it's written right here in Exodus. And he called the name of the place Massah and Mirhabah because the children of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Let me tell you, it's Hashem's divine name. They tempted Hashem, they tempted Yahweh saying, is Yahweh among us or not? This was the argument that happened 2,000 years ago. The argument was, is God among us or not? Is this the I am in Yeshua? And they didn't believe it. The whole thing was prophesied right from the beginning of Exodus and Genesis, or excuse me, in, in, in the children, in, the, in the, uh, the wilderness journey. God was showing that when Messiah would come that he would be smitten and that they wouldn't believe. They would not believe that Yahweh was among them. Yahweh. Why wouldn't they believe it? And that's why I read to you earlier when uh, uh, Yeshua says, except that you believe that I am. He said, you will die in your sins and accept that you believe that I am. They wanted to kill him for saying that. Now, I'm going to prove something to you here. This is going to be a little tough for you, but I'm going to prove something to you. This is in John chapter 8, and this is in, and this is why I say John has the best revelation of all the apostles. And you know, that's funny. Some of the Jews, they say, you know, that this, some, some uh, standing among you would not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He's seen him coming in his kingdom by the revelation of who he was. 
They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now they're accusing him of being born an illegitimate child. That's what they're doing, by the way, in case you didn't catch that. Yeshua said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You of your father, the devil, and the lust of the father will you do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he, spoke, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil. See, there it is again. There they're saying that Joseph is not his father, that uh, Mary must have got pregnant by, by a Syrian, uh, by a Roman, and has the devil. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily I say unto you, if a man keepeth my saying, he shall never see death. Hmm. There again, that's that life. Now, let me take you back, though. There's a very key verse here. And I don't know if you've really caught this or not. He says, but now you seek to kill me. Verse 40. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. A lot of people, especially in the Trinitarian movement, um, I, don't, I don't want to call it a movement. The Trinitarian believers, let me say it like that, that say that the three strangers that came down to Abraham was the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is not possible. Yeshua himself clears this up in the very statement that he says here. This is how we know that's not possible. Because he identifies himself as one of those strangers in this. And the one he identifies himself with is the key point in this. Notice again, verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have, excuse me, the told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. What is he saying here? When Yeshua was here, he tells the woman at the well, you've got five husbands, the one you're living with now is not yours. He tells her the truth. She doesn't want to kill him for this. She, he tells her the truth. All right, He does this over and over and over in his ministry, telling the people about their lives and the things they did. So, my question to you is, let's go back and let's look uh, at what Abraham does. Now, uh, let's see. Abraham. Pardon me just a moment on this here. Here we go right here. Genesis chapter 18. Now, the story here begins here in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door, in the heat of the day. This is Abraham sitting in the tent door. Now who appeared to Abraham? Yahweh. Hashem appears to him. And he left up his eye, lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet, uh, meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. 
and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let me, let me get this for you real quick in the, uh, in the Torah. Because there's some key points that you've got to see here. Okay. He so he ran toward them from the entrance of the tent, and he bowed toward the ground, and he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, please not pass away from your servant. Now, um, let me just real quick get these here so I don't have messed up. The Yomad Adonai, Imna Masati, Inanecha, Alna, Tavad Me'al Avadecha. Okay. Let some water be brought and wash your feet and recline beneath the tree. I will fetch a morsel of bread that you may sustain yourself, then go and inasmuch as you have passed your servant's way. They said, do so just as you have said. Now, it's important. When you get this part right here, let me, let me, let me back up to it so, you, so we don't miss this here. Okay, they yamru, that's and they said. Now, when they say something, they're just saying to him, "Do as you're saying you're going to do." There's no revelation of what's being said to Abraham as of yet. So Abraham hastened to the tent uh, to Sarah and said, "Hurry." Three, three seas of meal, fine flour, knead, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the ca cattle and took a calf and tender and good and gave it to the youth who, be who, who hurried to prepare it. He took cream and milk and, and, the, and, and the calf which he had prepared and placed these before them. He stood over them beneath the tree and they ate. Oh, by the way, for our kosher laws that we try to do, now that's one reason why I, I do keep kosher, but I don't believe that drinking the milk and eating the meat at the same time is considered incorrect because Abraham fed this to God himself and he ate it. So it didn't break kosher at all. So I disagree with that particular interpretation of our law when it says do not boil the, the mother, or the, yeah, the, the, the kid in the mother's milk. It has nothing to do with your stomach. It's talking about don't cook with it. That's what he's talking about. And he said, I surely return to you at this time next year. Okay, now here's, here's, where, here's where it is. He brings it here. And he, and he said, see, now, now we have a little change right here. Okay. I will uh, I will return to you this time next year and behold Sarah your wife will have a son now Sarah was listening in the entrance of the tent which was behind him now Abraham and Sarah were old and well in years the manner of women had ceased to be with Sarah and Sarah laughed at herself saying after I have withered shall I again I have delicate skin and my husband is old then Hashem said to Abraham why is it that Sarah laughed, saying, Shall I, in truth, bear a child, though I have aged? Who told Abraham the truth? Let me, let me read that to you again. That's in verse 13. Yod Gimel. The Yomer Yahweh El Abraham Lama ze tzahak Sarah le amer haav ameno umanam elav beani zakani zak excuse me zakanti zakanti. It is Hashem Himself. It is Yahweh Himself that reveals the secret. 
that tells Abraham the truth of what Sarah said. It is not the three. It is God himself that says this. And Yeshua identifies himself as the one that said that to Abraham. Yeshua tells us which one of the three he was. So it couldn't be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's not possible. Because he identified himself as the one that told Abraham the truth. And Abraham didn't want to kill him when he told him the truth. What was, what was that truth? It was bearing forth something she did that she shouldn't have done. She shouldn't have laughed about it. God is telling her what's going to happen. And then when God reveals to Abraham what she's doing, Abraham didn't jump up and want to kill him. Well, what do you mean, say my wife laughed? She didn't laugh. No, she didn't do that. But they did that with Yeshua. Why? They couldn't recognize who he was. That's what the shepherds were doing. They were driving away the women from the water, the well. Get away. Get away from the waters of life. No, I have nothing to do with it. That's what the preachers are doing today. You push the people away of knowing who Yeshua really is. He claimed himself to be not only the one that spoke to Abraham, but he claimed to be the one that told the truth to Abraham, which was Yahweh. It was God himself that told Abraham what the truth was. And Yeshua said that. He says, but now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. There's another one where he says, they say you're a man over 50 years old and you say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Hmm. I, I just, it's, it's amazing to me. But the thing is, when we really begin to recognize who Mashiach is, and I know I'm leaving out things. You should catch that message that I did with Jason E. Groff. There's many more things in there. And my heart is just troubled because I see so many people missing. You're missing out on the identity of the Messiah. You're missing out who He is. There, there are so many revelations out there. And when you recognize truly who He is, when you're able to believe who Yeshua is, this is what brings the new life. This is what brings redemption. And by the way, let me just show you another beautiful analogy on that. Everything that was happening in Yeshua's life was being typed out of all the things in the past. It's just like, for example, Yeshua's first bride was John the Baptist. You know how we know that? Because he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. He is a type of Eve. He came forth filled with the Holy Ghost. Eve came forth from the womb, so to speak, of Adam, filled with the Holy Ghost. We have no record that God had to breathe into her nostrils the breath of life, neither does he have to breathe into John's nostrils the breath of life. He comes filled with the Holy Ghost. God so typed out everything so clearly and so beautifully, how can we miss it? It's, it's just amazing. And so, anyway, as, I, as we close right now, again, I just, I want to thank all of you that are supporting our ministry, you are such a blessing. Um, we cannot thank you enough. And uh, many of you know that our, we, we have plans to, to, to go to North Carolina to move the ministry there. That is a huge endeavor. And I, I get emails from many of you that have emailed me and said, you know, what is your need? You know, and I never tell the people the need. I, I know I don't. Um, let me just share with you the why we're doing this. I know, I think I have, in, in some degree, I've shared this with you. In order for me to go full-time in the ministry and also to get my family in a safe place because of the economic situation that's going to strike this earth very soon, 
I kind of think that we're going to see an economic meltdown probably next year sometime. Um, it, it, it won't be for long because they're bringing in the world order. That's the whole purpose for the meltdown of the economy. But our, our dollars will become worthless. You know, we, we, I, now I don't personally have a stockpile of money, period. If I did, I'd already have moved to North Carolina. I would already do the, be doing the ministry full time. But the thing is, we're going to go there by God's grace, and we're going to build a cob, well, they call it a cob house, a dirt home. We're going to use solar panels, well water, to where, one, we have no water bill, no electric bill, and no house payment. Now, we do not own a home. We sold our house many years ago, and we only leased while we were here in South Florida. But we're having extremely high bills. And because of that, I work as well. I move pianos. My body is getting to the point where it doesn't like that very well anymore. Uh, I'm right at 50 years old now, so it's hard for me to do that. But I feel passionately that God wants us full-time in the ministry. And the only way for us to do that is to buy this property. You know, the property that we have signed the contract on is 20000 I don't have 20000 but I'm believing God is going to pro provide somehow or another that's going to happen. Um, to build a cob home is not that expensive. To do the electric, the solar panels and everything, I don't, I don't really know the, the cost of everything. But we're going to go live in tents to do it. Other than what we're going to have in Asheville, North Carolina, our intention is, if this is if God is in, in this, we will actually put together... Um, in Asheville, a little office there. That'll be the only dwelling that we have, just a little office there for the ministry where people can come and actually have a live, not just a live by radio, but if you want to come and, and have a service services together, you can come and visit, especially Asheville. Such a beautiful place for people to do vacations and stuff, so we wanted to make it, it serves many purposes for people to come. Also, it puts my family away from harm's way if so, if, if if for example, if the Lord leads me to go to Israel in the spring of the year, which I'm trusting that He will, that's another thing that we're looking to see if God is going to provide for that. That's a costly endeavor to go to Israel, uh, but if He leads me there to go and try to speak to my own people, which I'm passionately feel that He wants me to do this, um, then we have that cost as well. But if we get rid of the mortgage, we get rid of the electric, and we get rid of water and all these other things that we normally have to pay, then I don't have to physically go out and work anymore and we can do the ministry full time. Because then it doesn't take that much money for us to live on. Just the basics. We're going to grow our own food, etc. And then you're back to nature. You're in the mountains. You can go and pray and seek God the way I so feel in my heart that He wants me to do. And to where I can speak to you far more often. Um, and we will, then we will actually be speaking to you a lot more as well. Uh, so we, we ask, we, you know, prayerfully see if the Lord leads you specifically in any way here. And, and, and being a part of this ministry, helping us with this move, because in essence, and also if you feel that you'd like to come when we get ready to uh, build the home, and like I said, we're believing that on faith, because we don't have the money as of yet to do this. We're just trusting God that God will provide. Um, and uh, if you feel, and I have a, we have a fleece before the Lord to find out if this truly is His will. And I'm not going to say what that is, but there is a fleece before Him. So we'll find out this weekend just exactly if God is in this move. And if He's not, then we'll pray to see what else He might have in mind. Anyway, we love you. God bless you. Don't forget Shabbat Live this coming Friday beautiful message especially for you sisters I beg you let the, I'll get brother Jason to put together the um, um, the, the link for us uh, so that you'll be able to post it everywhere you're gonna want sisters brothers as well brothers need to hear this message because you need to recognize your wife as your partner not a doormat not your servant she's your partner God bless you till we meet again we love you. IsraelReturns.com, by the way, if you're wanting to give, that's our website. It always pops up at the end of the message here. You can donate there online. 
uh, securely. It's a PayPal link, but you can use any kind of credit card. And uh, also, if you prefer to mail in, uh, you can mail it in to Danoon Institute, at 12537 Gemstone Court, Fort Myers, Florida, 33913. I'll post that link as well here for you on the screen, as well as inside the, uh, the links there. Uh, but, but be of good cheer. We love you. And we so thank God for all of you that stand with us, stand behind us. Uh, I hope I didn't offend you in any way. I hope that this message is a blessing because uh, I know that I see sometimes the arguments. Trinitarians and oneness people are fighting each other in the chats there. You guys both have a lot of truth there. But I hope this helps you to understand who Yeshua really is. He is Hanukkah. He is the light. And by the way, I didn't tell you that one part. The oil that mysteriously lasted for eight days. It was one cruise of oil that would only light the menorah for one day, but it lasted for eight days. You know why that happened? It represents the Spirit of Almighty God that would be embodied in one container. God would be contained in one vessel, and that vessel would not only light the next seven church ages to come, but it would also would be the light of the millennium. That's why it's eight days. God bless you.